Well, hello and welcome to our next 125 Zoom session for July the 8th, 2019. This is our third last session. We'll spend this week on retrocochlear pathology and I would imagine we'll also spend next week on the 15th on retrocochlear pathology and <clears throat> excuse me and I will be uploading these of course into unit 3 on our uh, canvas and then on the following week I'm looking at my calendar here on the 22nd Monday the 22nd we will finish the course with the last unit on pseudo hypocusis so this week and next week retrocochlear pathology and the week after next pseudo hypocusis all righty then without any further ado let's look at our notes and our powerpoints for pseudo hypocusis share screen and where's the notes here we go retrocochlear disorders and special testing retrocochlear disorders and special tests retrocochlear means behind the cochlea behind the cochlea eighth nerve and brain stem and brain all of those pathologies are retrocochlear i'll say it right at the beginning as well retrocochlear pathology is not all that common okay it's not like presbycusis and noise induced hearing loss it's fairly rare thank god there's only about one in a hundred thousand people that have a retrocochlear pathology that needs immediate surgery okay the most common retrocochlear pathology is eighth nerve tumor and eighth nerve tumors are almost always unilateral one ear or the other ear not both and this is why the red flag of unilateral sensory neural loss okay unilateral sensory neural loss is a red flag and that's something that you need to send or can refer to an audiologist or to a physician to rule out an eighth nerve tumor i mean let me stop sharing for just a sec here you can have ret unilateral sensory neural loss if you've had more exposure to noise in this here maybe you're a right-handed uh, rifle shooter and so or a le and, and so you're going to have most hearing loss in the left ear because Again, what we showed you last week, okay? Maybe you're a right-handed dentist, the drill. Maybe you're a trucker and your left, the window's down and your left ear gets most of the noise. Okay, that may very well happen. Or you might have Meniere's disease, which is a cochlear pathology. And Meniere's, we said, usually strikes in one ear and it may strike later on in the other ear but for the at the beginning it may just be in one ear so you have to take into account a case history always but when nothing else points in the direction of having a unilateral sensory neural loss and please separate this from a unilateral conductive hearing loss which might be an earache okay otitis media okay so rule that out okay but if the hearing loss is sensory neural and there's no history of noise exposure and there's no history of dizziness or vertigo or meniere's like symptoms and the person may be a young mother of three kids 30 years old and just says yeah i for some reason can't hear on the phone anymore with my left ear or my right ear I don't know, and I can't understand speech very, I just, uh, I'm having, I don't know, I just feel, uh, and you've done a hearing test, and the hearing loss is sensory neural, that's, and there's hearing loss in just the one ear, that's cause for a referral, because it could be an eighth nerve tumor, and an eighth nerve tumor may be benign, it's not malignant, but an eighth nerve tumor can kill you, because the eighth nerve opens up onto the brain stem. And the tumor will keep growing, and it would that require surgery to get it out. So let's look at the eighth nerve pathology, and let's just see, check out what's going on here. So share screen, go to the notes, and read with me. Retrocochlear here means pathology to the eighth nerve or brain stem, usually acoustic neuromas. Okay, eighth nerve acoustic. Neuroma, OMA. Every time you see the term OMA, think tumor. 
tumor of the eighth nerve, also known as a schwannoma. Now, Schwann cells are the white myelin cells that cover nerves. Okay, so we're going to look at that in just a second. The central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord. Now, read what it says there. The brain stem is simply the spinal cord inside your skull. The peripheral nervous system, PNS, consists of everything else. So if you were asked on a quiz, is the eighth nerve part of the central or the peripheral nervous system, what would you say? Well, you should say it's part of the peripheral nervous system because even though it's inside the skull, it's not the brain and it's not the spinal cord. The brain and spinal cord, think of a sp the, the spinal cord as part of your brain that leaves your skull and goes all the way down to your bum. <laughs> okay? It goes down your back. It's a, your brain has a tail. And think of the tail of your brain as being the spinal cord. The brain and spinal cord are the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is everything else, all other nerves. So, <clears throat> You have that, put stars by that. Now let's move down to this section here. And you put a star by these four definitions. Nerves, ganglia, tracts, nuclei. And you can draw a line underneath this one here, this sentence here, okay? Because nerves and ganglia are part of the, per, are the peripheral nervous system. Tracts and nuclei, are part of the central nervous system. And what are these things? Well, nerves is the white matter in the peripheral nervous system. For example, the eighth nerve. If you were to look at it under a microscope, its color would be white. And that white is the myelin, the fatty sheath that lines the arm of the eighth nerve. Okay? The inner arm of the eighth nerve may be gray. And the cell body of the eighth nerve may be gray. And what are the cell bodies of the eighth nerve? Well, they're the spiral ganglia. Remember your anatomy? The spiral ganglia is a bunch of eighth nerve cell bodies in a big lump. And they are not covered with, the, with myelin. It's only the, the arms of the neurons that are covered with the white matter. And so nerves are white matter in the peripheral nervous system. Ganglia are unmyelinated gray matter in the peripheral nervous system. And your example there is the arm of the eighth nerve is white, and it goes from the spiral ganglia to the brain stem. It's about an inch long. And the gray matter of the eighth nerve is the spiral ganglia. Tracts, on the other hand, are white matter arms of the neurons in the, per, in the central nervous system. And you can think of an example. What is about the bridge that links the halves of your brain? The corpus callosum, the big white matter bridge, okay? Gray matter would be, in, are called nuclei. So where does the eighth nerve end when it goes to the brain stem? It ends at the cochlear nucleus. You have two of them, of course, one for the right and one for the left. And then the next nucleus, remember your 120 anatomy, what's the next nucleus up? The superior olivary complex. And what's the next pair of nuclei up? The lateral lemniscus. And what's the next pair of nuclei going up your brain stem? This, this, the uh, uh, inferior colliculi. And what happens next? You go to the thalamus, medial geniculate bodies. And what's next? The temporal lobes, Heschel's gyrus, primary auditory cortex. All of these areas are gray matter. They are nuclei inside the brain stem. And the, the, all the arms of the neurons are, are white, but the nuclei themselves are gray. And that's what we need to remember here. Let's see if we have any pictures of, of any of this. Let's just take a look here. And you can see on the screen. All right, here's the uh, scala media of the cochlea, two and a half turns. And look at all this white matter. These are the, uh, this is the uh, 
the, the, the neuron fibers. Think of the eighth nerve like a rope. You know, I'll move this dark green thing out of the way. Come here. Okay. Eighth nerve fibers are coiled like a rope. The lows are inside, the highs are outside. Remember that? So the eighth nerve is tonotopic. Specific frequencies are represented in specific places. And here's the eighth nerve fibers, thousands of them. How many? 30,000. Remember that, because each inner hair cell has 10 eighth nerve fibers exiting it. Okay? Inner hair cells send info to the brain. How? Along the eighth nerve fibers. So you've got 10 of these fibers connecting to each inner hair cell. 33,000 inner hair cells, 30,000 eighth nerve fibers. And look at how the low frequency ones at the apex of the cochlea are buried deep inside the eighth nerve, whereas the high frequency ones are wrapped around the outside. Tonotopic, specific frequencies are represented in specific places. Here, a picture showing you spiral ganglia of the eighth nerve. There you go. Look like a little olive. You get the feeling you're being watched. Okay? Inner hair cells, all kinds of eighth nerve fibers are attached to them. And this, this arm of the eighth nerve actually isn't myelinated. It's gray. And that allows the hair cells to give greater or lesser amounts of response. But at any rate, when you get to the spiral ganglia, this is gray as well. It's not covered. But then when you leave, okay, this is the axon now. This is the main arm going out to the brainstem. And this is white. Okay? So eighth nerve, white matter, peripheral nervous system. Spiral ganglia of the eighth nerve, gray matter, peripheral nervous system. You get it? Good. Notice how the outer hair cells are hardly in cahoots with the eighth nerve at all. Once you get to the brain stem, the proverbial crap hits the fan. So here's an auditory fiber, what you know, the eighth nerve, and it hits the brain stem. And where it gets to the brain stem, now you have an explosion of different kinds of cells. Because now you're getting into the brain area, the central nervous system. So all of a sudden, the simple eighth nerve is just carrying info to where it's got to go. But now you've got processing going on, recognition of patterns of sound. So things get a lot more complicated. Here's a picture of an eighth nerve tumor. You can see the tumor right there. Now I'm wondering if in this particular PowerPoint slide, I may have a schematic of things. I'm not sure. Somehow, oh yeah, here, look at this. It's good to get a grip on this right away. Let's look at this picture. Here's the cochlea. There's a cochlea. Auditory nerve, eighth nerve. Auditory nerve, eighth nerve. Now the brain stem. This is the spinal cord inside the skull. And look at the nuclei inside. Cochlear nucleus, gray. Cochlear nucleus, gray. Superior olivary complex, gray. SOC, gray. Okay? These are clusters of cell bodies of neurons surrounded by white matter. Okay? Because those are all the arms of things. Look at here. This would be a tract. This is a tract. This is a tract. All the arrows are tracts meaning white matter connections, neurons, axons, going to the next level higher. But the cell bodies of the neurons themselves are gray. Now we'll go home here and take a, another look, okay? Let's go to our notes, I should say. And stop sharing, go to the notes. Okay. So be sure we have these four definitions down. White matter, gray matter, and what is white matter, and what is gray matter, all right? Remember from 120 anatomy. Very important to retain the information we carry from previous courses. And this, is, this course especially requires that. You really got to take into account the anatomy and also a bit of audiometry. We, we're really fusing things together here to understand the disorders. So, gray matter, white matter, peripheral nervous system, central nervous system. 
Now, the eighth nerve is a sensory nerve as opposed to a motor nerve. You have two kinds of neurons. Now, neurons, bless our hearts, what the Sam Hill are neurons. Neurons are simply these guys. Okay, I'll pull this closer so we can look at it. Each fiber is a neuron, neuron fibers. And they're wrapped like ropes, like thousands of fibers together, wrapped together like a rope, and this is the nerve. Okay, if you have thousands of fibers like this in the peripheral nervous system, each one of those is called a neuron. Wrapped together like a rope, now it's called a tract. Tracts are white matter in the central nervous system. Nerves are white matter in the peripheral nervous system. Nuclei are unmyelinated gray gatherings of cell bodies in the central nervous system. Ganglia are the same thing in the peripheral nervous system. So always think of your examples, okay? Your example of a ganglia, spiroganglia. Your examples of nuclei, cochlear nuclei, superior all very complex, lateral lemniscus and all that crap. Good. All right. Keep sharing. All right. You have two types of neuron fibers. Some are afferent, some are efferent. Afferent means going to the brain. Efferent means coming back from the brain. Two-way street, remember? Just like the acoustic reflex has an afferent part of the arc and an efferent part of the arc. Well, all afferent going, brain going information is sensory. And just think about it, okay? Sensory. So let's just stop sharing and talk. Vision, smell, taste, hearing, touch. All of that sensory information is brain going. Makes sense, doesn't it? What's brain exiting muscles, glands, glands and muscles, okay? Those are the only two recipients of exiting, brain exiting information. Because you see stuff and you react to stuff and your reaction is efferent. Your sensory stuff is afferent. Good. Now, remember from anatomy, afferent neurons are bipolar. They'll have a cell body with two arms. Okay, that's that they all do. Eighth nerve, for example, cell bodies in the spiral ganglia, a little arm going to the inner hair cells, and a much longer arm going to the brain stem. Okay, but still bipolar. One arm longer than the other, but basically one cell body with two arms. Sensory afferent neurons. And each neuron fiber has a cell body. So how many cell bodies are involved with the eighth nerve? 30,000. Where are they? In the spiral ganglia of the cochlea. Good. Motor neurons are multipolar. Lots of arms. One cell body. Buku arms, those are motor neurons going to the arms and legs, muscles, face, everything else. All right, so now share screen again and look. Okay, eighth nerve is a sensory nerve as opposed to a motor nerve. Sensory nerves are bi bipolar, motor neurons are multipolar. The eighth nerve is the shortest of all your cranial nerves. You have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. The eighth pair is the shortest one. It's only one inch long. Let's read a little bit about cochlear, retrocochlear pathology. The main sign is unilateral sensory neural loss. Now, sign, circle that word. Signs are seen. Symptoms are reported. Always know the difference between a sign and a symptom. A patient reports symptoms of da 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 da. Signs of it are seen by the clinician. Okay, so if a person reports dizzy spells, you can't see it unless you see the person stumbling around. That's a sign. 
All right. Eighth nerve tumors are not at all very common. According to Martin in the textbook Introduction to Audiology, they occur at a rate of about one per 100,000 people. So I'm not sure exactly how big Springfield, Missouri is. Say, some say about 200,000. Maybe there's about two people with eighth nerve tumor in Springfield, Missouri. Audiologists see very few acoustic neuromas, eighth nerve tumors. But the few that are detected, it's very important to refer to a physician to get that person out of your office. You may not fit with hearing amplification until you've gotten medical approval to do so. According to Schuchnecht, 1974, Remember, remember Schuchnecht, he's the guy that classified and coined the four different types of presbycusis, sensory, neural, strial, cochlear mechanical, okay, or conductive mechanical. Anyway, acoustic numerous comprise about 8 to 10% of all intracranial tumors. Intra means within, cranial, within the skull, within the head. Okay, of all brain tumors that you can have, Eighth nerve tumors comprise about 8 to 10%. So 1 in 10% of brain tumors are eighth nerve tumors. The initial symptom for acoustic tumors is usually unilateral hearing loss, sometimes tinnitus, sometimes vestibular problems. Acoustic tumors are not, don't have to be very big, only about one centimeter maybe to two centimeters in size. Always remember what a centimeter is. Look at the width of your fingernail. That's about a centimeter. They grow at the rate of about 0.1 centimeter a year. The tumor size has effect on ABR and other test performance. Circle ABR and right in your margin, auditory brain stem response test. Auditory brain stem response. Then what is it? Let's look at it. And we'll look at what an ABR is, okay? To the bigger the tumor, the better is the test at detecting the pathology. In other words, the larger the tumor, the better chance an ABR has to catch it. The smaller tumors are harder to find. Retrocochlear pathology is relatively hard to detect. So put a star by this because retrocochlear pathology is the test ground of tests. It's where the tests of hearing are really tested themselves because eighth nerve tumors are hard to find. It's not like, oh, you know, presbycusis. Oh, the hearing levels went down in the high frequencies. Duh. All right. Retrocochlear pathology isn't that common and it needs to be found for sure. The best test for retrocochlear pathology are CAT scans, and even better is an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs. Those are the best tests at catching it. So let's look at what an ABR first, first of all looks like, because this is a test that the HIS does not do. So let's go to look in our PowerPoints here, down to what an ABR might look like. The auditory brainstem response. I'm just playing around here. So here's an auditory, whoops. I'm going to blow it up a little, make it a little larger so we can see it better. All right, here's an ABR. I'm going to get this guy out of the way. Okay, right ear, left ear. Now look at the right ear here first. See how you've, it's got five bumps. One, two, three, four, Five. How did they do ABR? They put a little a headphone on your on your ear, but they have electrodes as well. They'll put one electrode on this ear lobe, one electrode on this ear lobe, one electrode as a ground right here at the at your hairline in the middle, and a fourth electrode will be put here. These are They'll put a little bit of gel on the electrode and stick it on the earlobes, stick it here, stick it here, and put tape on to keep it there. And then they'll put a headphone on here and a headphone over here. And out of the headphone come these weird things called clicks. Now, what is a click? A click, look at the waveform of a click. It's just a spike. 
and they'll put thousands of these. And a click sounds literally like, like a click. And because it's so such a short little wave, so brief, it has a broad spectrum, very broad. Here's its waveform, here's its spectrum. It's a splatter. It's like taking a snowball and throwing it against the wall. So it doesn't contain just one frequency, it contains lots of them. And what they do is they'll put hundreds of or thousands of these clicks in the ear. And each click creates a little bit of a wave. And these little waves are buried in your background EEGs, buried in your brain waves. These little waves can't even be seen. They're so dang small, but they are time locked to the, to the click. This click here created that wave. This click here created this one. This click here created this one. They'll add them up, 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 and divide by the number of clicks, and you'll get the waves. We don't study this. We don't do it. Audiologists do it. And they do it when suspecting an eighth nerve tumor, but they'll also do it to test a baby's hearing. Maybe the baby, they want to find out if the baby has normal hearing or not. Or maybe someone's lying and you'll want to find out if he's got normal hearing or not. Do an ABR. Look what happened here. When they did the ABR and the clicks were 80 decibels, nice five peaks. One, two, three, four, five. Made it softer, the waves got smaller and a little bit delayed. Made the sound softer, the clicks, the waves start to disappear, but you still have peak five. Make the click softer, the waves are gone, but you still have the final one. If you still have a peak five at 20 decibels, you're, you've got essentially normal hearing. And that might happen in the person's left ear as well. Okay, let's look at what happens now if you've got a tumor. So one application of doing the ABR is to test someone's hearing non-behaviorally, to find out what he hears. But the bad thing about it is you don't know what, what, at what frequency because the clicks are so broad in their frequencies. So you don't know where the person's got normal hearing, but you do know he or she's got normal hearing somewhere in this range because he's still at an ABR all the way down to 20. Now, another reason for doing ABR, and see, here's a picture of where they put electrodes on sometimes. Anyway, and here's a picture of ABRs done loud and then softer, 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 softer. And you can see how the peaks disappear, but peak five, if it's still visible all the way down here, you got normal hearing, okay? But here's another application of doing the ABR, and it's for eighth nerve tumors. So let's say this person had an eighth nerve tumor in his or her left ear, okay? The right ear, normal, 80, all the peaks there, 60, most of the peaks there, peak five is a little bit delayed, down to 30, the peaks are gone, but you still have peak five, normal. Now let's look at the left. At 90 dB HL, look at how spread out the waves are. Look carefully at this one. Where did, the, look at how broad this one to five is compared to this one to five. See how tight these are together? Now, where's the difference? Is the difference between three and five, that spread with my cursor here? See, that's quite a bit like this spread. That didn't change much. Where's the change in this left one? It's really the spread between one and three. One and three is this big whereas one and three here is smaller. Now the eighth nerve and ABR are kind of like this. Let me describe it for you. Peak number one, the first peak, comes from the spiral ganglia, where the eighth nerve is leaving the cochlea. Peak two is where the eighth nerve meets the brainstem, cochlear nucleus. Peak three is kind of a little bit higher up in the brain stem. Could be the superior olivary complex. Peaks four and five are higher up in the brain stem. So peaks one and two are looking mostly at the eighth nerve. And peaks three to five are looking at the brain stem. You can think of it almost like 
and I'll show you, I'll stop sharing. Peaks one to three kind of represent the, the horizontal one inch long eighth nerve, and peaks three to five kind of represent the one, eight, one inch long brainstem. Auditory brainstem response, a horizontal and a vertical thing. So where is the delay where I showed you in this PowerPoint? Share screen, all right? Share screen and look at the look at the note, look at the PowerPoint slide. The delay is really here, so you know the person's got an eighth nerve tumor. And let me also be careful to tell you that how big does the hearing loss need to be to be called an eighth nerve tumor? Doesn't have to be very big. It maybe the person's got a, a mild 30 decibel sensory neural loss. I'll stop sharing screen. Oh, no, I'm just gonna hang on a second here. Let's just show you an example. Examples are always better. So forget that. Let's show you an example here of the kind of hearing loss that might be associated with an eighth nerve tumor. Make it bigger. Okay. I call this person, uh-oh. <laughs> okay. I made up a person, the date of birth and some, some physician's name or whatever. But look at the right ear. Normal. Normal. Look at the left ear. Mild hearing loss. Doesn't have to be that much. And then when they tested the left ear by bone conduction, same thing. So you know the left ear has a sensory neural loss. The hearing isn't any better by bone conduction than it is by air conduction. So it's not, repeat, not conductive. And the tympanometry <clears throat> would be normal. Type A tympanogram, type A tympanogram. The acoustic reflexes, though, would be present for the right ear, but they would be absent for the left ear. Speech audiometry, SRT, the softest that the right ear could hear, would be down to about zero. Remember what we said last week? Softest that the person could hear two-syllable spondy words has to agree with the pure tone average of hearing at 500, 1,000, and 2,000 hertz. PTA, Parent Teachers Association, pure tone average. If the pure tone average here is going to be about zero to five, the speech reception threshold should be about zero to five. So in the right ear, all is good. God's in his heaven, all's well with the world. Same with the left ear. What's the, what's the pure tone average here? 25, 30, 30. Add those up together, you'll get about 25 to 30. Speech reception threshold will probably be 25 to 30 in the left ear, so there's no, mis there's no mystery there. What's going to be different is the speech discrimination. The single syllable words presented at the client's most comfortable loudness. So what's a normal most comfortable loudness? Well, for the right ear, probably between 50 and 60. And when the single syllable words were read at 50 to 60 into the guy's right ear, all the words were guessed correctly. And now let's find out what the MCL, most comfortable loudness, might be for the left ear. Oh, it might be around 70 or 80 because there's a bit of hearing loss. Present the words at 70 to 80 and the person does terribly, even at most comfortable loudness. That's a second sign of eighth nerve pathology. Sign number one is unilateral sensory neural loss. Sign number two is abnormally poor speech discrimination because the eighth nerve is affected and the, what's going up to the brain is getting garbled due to the tumor. So a garbled message is meeting the brain. So speech discrimination or word recognition will be abnormally poor for eighth nerve pathology. Now here's another example out of Martin the textbook that you may have. I'm not sure if your version even has this, but have a look anyway. This one's saying an acoustic neuroma or an audiogram exempl showing a left acoustic neuroma. Although the hearing loss in the left ear is mild, word recognition is poor and just decreases further. Now let's see if I can move that out of the way. At higher intensities, naturally, proper masking is essential, blah, 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 blah. Well, let's look at what they're saying here. Right ear, right ear, speech reception thresholds, five, that agrees with pure tone average. Left ear, 15, 
15, 30, add those numbers up, divide by 3, you get about 20. So the SRT agrees with pure tone average for the left ear. But they read this person a, wor a word list, and person only got 74%. And then they made the sound even louder, and the person's speech discrimination got poorer. Okay? That's something what we call rollover. Poor speech recognition ability. Poorer than would be expected, given only the slight degree or the very mild degree of the person's hearing loss. Okay? So let's get, out, get this out of the way here and go to our notes. Let's share screen here and look at our notes. Oh, boy, I got all this crap laying all over the place here. Put this on the bottom. Let's see if I can move this guy. I don't know. I want to just move it around. Ah, I can't see what happens when you start moving. Okay. All right. So we'll move it to the bottom of the screen here, sort of, kind of. All right. Here we go. Now, a word about tests and how to test a test. Because remember what it says in the line up above. Retrocochlear pathology is relatively difficult to detect. It is therefore the testing ground for many tests. A word about tests. How to test a test. Put stars by these. There's two words that you're going to see lots in the field. One's called validity and the other one's called reliability. Validity is the accuracy of the test. Is it testing what it says it's testing? Okay. Is the ABR truly testing for eighth nerve tumors? How good is it at testing for eighth nerve tumors? And the other thing is how reliable is it? Will it get the same results again and again? So validity refers to the accuracy of something. Reliability refers to the stability of something. Will the test be consistent? Those are two words to keep in mind. Here's another couple, and you probably will remember these from acoustics that you took a couple of semesters that you took a while ago. You got four of them here. Remember these? Well, they're back. This time we're not talking about thresholds for hearing a tone. Let's look at what those are in gray. Let's review that and then apply it to tests. Okay, true positives. You heard the tone and you raised your hand. Okay, let's just, let's just highlight just the true positives here. Your th hearing thresholds. Remember this from a, from a while ago. The tone was presented and you said, yep, that's the true positive. Regarding a test, the person has a disease and the test catches it and says, yep, you've got the disease. For example, eighth nerve tumor. If you got an eighth nerve tumor and the test caught you, yep, that's a true positive. Just like if you heard a tone and you raised your hand, true positive. Okay? Notice the two things. You either hear it or you don't, or you have the disease or you don't. And you raised your hand when you heard the tone or the test caught you if you heard, had the disease. Either one, true positives. One is referring to thresholds, but the other application refers to tests. Now let's look at true negatives. You didn't hear the tone, and you didn't raise your hand. Maybe the tone was below your threshold. You couldn't hear it, so you didn't raise your hand. You had a true negative. The tone wasn't heard, and you didn't say yes. When it comes to a test, a true negative means you don't have an eighth nerve tumor. And when they did the ABR on you, the ABR said, nope, you don't have an eighth nerve tumor. The ABRs are normal. Okay, true negative. Now let's look at false positives and false negatives. Remember in when regarding thresholds, Mrs. McGillicuddy, the Las Vegas gambler, always guessing all the time? The tone isn't present, but she's raising her hand anyway. She's guessing. Okay? True. That's a false positive. What's a false positive concerning a test? The person doesn't have an eighth nerve tumor, but the ABR or the test used to look at it says he, says he does. 
That's a false positive. That's going to be a pain in the arse. Okay, that means that you got to drop your day of work. Now you got to drive to St. Louis to a bigger place to get another test done at a bigger hospital. And that test might be the MRI or CAT scan. And that test says, no, you don't have the eighth nerve tumor. The audiologist just thought you did when he or she did your ABR. And the ABR said you did, but you know what? The better test called the MRI said you didn't. So go scot-free. What happened to you was a hassle. You lost a day of work. What's a false negative? Regarding thresholds, you may have heard the tone, but you didn't believe you did, so you didn't raise your hand. The tone was present, you heard it, but you didn't decide to raise your hand because you weren't sure. False negative. Regarding a test, a false negative is really bad because it means you've got the eighth nerve tumor and the test said, nah, you didn't. You don't have a problem. Well, what'll happen there is you could die. So false positives is one kind of an error and it just causes you a great inconvenience, but false negatives are even more dangerous because you could walk out of the office not misdiagnosed, okay, and you'll have a problem. So this is not good. All right, so remember those terms, those four terms have a grip on what they are. Remember what they are from thresholds in acoustics. Psychoacoustics, remember that unit? I believe it was unit four in psychoacoustics in 110. That's where we talked about these things. Well, now we are revisiting these things, but the application this time concerns tests for retrocochlear pathology. So now let's look at our PowerPoint slides and let's look at what we've talked about here. Validity is, oh boy, let me make, make, make this green thing out of the way. Is the test truly testing what it says it's testing? It's an accuracy thing. Reliability, will the test show the same results again and again? That's a stability thing. If a test is valid, it's going to be reliable. If a test is reliable, it may not necessarily be valid. It may re really be consistent, but it may be consistently wrong. <laughs> okay. Here, let's review this from acoustics. You're hearing a tone at 50 dB. You can hear it no problem. You've got normal hearing. Okay. This could have said 50 dB at HL2. Doesn't matter. Don't worry about that. Just hearing the tone. You've got, let's say you have hearing down to zero. Every time the 50 dB tone is heard or, or is present, you're going to say, yep. And every time the 50 dB tone is absent, you're going to say, nope. So all your responses are going to fall here or here. And here is true positives. Here is true negatives. You're going to make no mistakes. But if the tone is now at 5 dB, it's going to be harder. The task is harder. When the tone is present, you may say yes. But sometimes when the tone is absent, you're going to say yes. Because the, the, the task is harder. So here's a true positive. Here's a false positive. Sometimes when the tone is present, you might say no. Maybe you burped or maybe you swallowed when the tone was pressed. Whatever. You could hear it, but you decided to say no. All right. False negatives. So your responses are going to fall more across all four boxes. True positives, true negatives, but sometimes false positives and sometimes false negatives. All right. So when you're looking at tests, for retrocochlear pathology, instead of talking about 5 dB or 50 dB, softer or louder, let's talk about how sensitive a test is. If a test for eighth nerve tumors is extremely sensitive, it's going to catch everyone who's got the eighth nerve tumor. Yep. Every time the person has an eighth nerve tumor, he or she's going to be caught. But sometimes, when the person doesn't have an eighth nerve tumor, the hyper or overly sensitive test might say, yeah, you have a tumor. False positive. 
That's what causes the drag of the person having to drive to dro drop a day of work, drive to St. Louis and get to a bigger hospital for, for an MRI. Okay, that's called hassle. All right. So true pause, a test may be really sensitive. And if it's really sensitive, it'll catch everyone who has the disease, but it might catch people who don't have the disease. Let's look at the word specific. When you're looking at the word specific, that's different. Specificity means the test passes everyone who doesn't have the disease. So look at the right bottom box. All true negatives. Everyone without the eighth nerve tumor is going to be lead scot-free. Go ahead, you don't have the tumor. But maybe the test is going to let some people go who do have a small eighth nerve tumor that wasn't picked up by the test. False negatives. Okay, so a test that's really specific is going to pass everyone that doesn't have the disease. It'll have lots of true negatives, but it might end up having some false negatives too. It might end up being so lax that it's letting some people through that do have the eighth nerve tumor. So sensitivity by itself doesn't give a test a straight A. Specificity by itself doesn't give a test a straight A. What gives a test a straight A is if it is a gold standard. Okay? Here, the sensitivity, the ability of a test to identify someone who's got the disease. Specificity, the ability of a test to pass someone who doesn't have the disease. Most medical tests are not 100% sensitive and 100% specific. We're human after all. We're not robots. We try, T-R-Y, but we're not perfect, P-E-R-F-E-C-T. We're not. That's why in medicine, you do tests to back things up. If one test says you have it, you're tested again with a different kind of test to see if that holds true. Because most tests are not 100% sensitive, nor are they 100% specific. A gold standard is. A gold standard is pretty well a perfect test. It's 100% sensitive and 100% specific. It passes everyone that doesn't have the disease and it fails everyone that does have the disease. And there's no false positives and no false negatives. There's only true positives and true negatives. Rare. Let's give an example of a test that might be a gold standard. Look in the ear canal with an otoscope. Does the person have wax? The okay, that's about that's a gold standard because you're looking in and yeah, I can see it. There's the wax right there. Okay, more complicatedly, an MRI, a magnetic resonance imaging. Now, an MRI is where they put you in a tube, you're laying down, CAT scans are like this too, and they take slices. Okay, it looks at slices of your brain going down, down, and then it looks at slices going this way, and slices going this way, and then it'll look at slices going this way. Okay, so it's going, so it's different than an x ray. It's not just looking at bone, it's looking at slices of your head through, and they inject you with a dye in your hand to really increase the white and black contrast. Now that sucker, that test is almost a gold standard. It's pretty well, if you've got an eighth nerve tumor, it's going to find it, even if it's a small one. So can you see how your tests kind of line up? Let's look at this as talk here, okay? And instead of looking at PowerPoint slides, let's make sure we understand this. Maybe someone's got a unilateral sensory neural loss in one ear. That's one sign. Does it mean he has an eighth nerve tumor? Not necessarily, but it's indicative. It's a sign. Could be. 
It's not 100% sensitive. It's not 100% specific. It's kind of, mm. Now you do word recognition, poor speech discrimination. It's also another sign of eighth nerve tumor. But it doesn't have to be an eighth nerve tumor. It could be. It kind of points in the direction. Okay. What's the third test? ABR. Okay. That's, get, that's getting there. That's a stronger test. Okay. It's, you know why it's a stronger test? Because it's non-behavioral. Doesn't re doesn't re require raising a hand, okay? Uh -uh. Nothing voluntary in it. You're looking at brain waves. You cannot control those. That is what happens, okay? If you've got an eighth nerve tumor, it's like a rock in the stream. The water has to go around the rock, okay? Your ABR is going to look abnormal, all right? What's another test? What's a fourth test for eighth nerve tumor? Acoustic reflexes. What's the acoustic reflex arc? Outer ear to middle ear to cochlea. What part of the cochlea? Inner hair cells. Going to the eighth nerve. Going to the brain stem. Now you're leaving the brain stem. Going down the fifth cranial nerve to the tensor tympani muscle. Going down the seventh cranial nerve to the stapedius muscle. That's the efferent portion. All right. So. The acoustic reflex arc, does it involve the eighth nerve? Yep. So if the eighth nerve has a tumor, are you going to have normal acoustic reflexes? Nope. All right. That's another fairly strong test. It's more sensitive and more specific than an asymmetrical sensory neural loss. It's more sensitive and more specific than poor word recognition in that ear. Those are behavioral tests. Behavioral tests are voluntary. And voluntary tests do not tend to be as specific and sensitive as non-behavioral. So you got an acoustic reflex is stronger, ABR is stronger yet, CAT scan. Now what's a CAT scan? Same thing as an MRI, just less contrast. It's cheaper. Smaller centers will have CAT scans. But not every center is going to have MRIs. Springfield, Missouri will have MRIs, but little towns around it won't. Okay, they may have CAT scans, but that's about as good as it gets. CAT scans are a little bit better than ABR, but not much, because they're more blurry. They're, it's like a lower level type of scan. Okay, it still does the things that does the slices we were talking about, but it's not, not as good as an MRI. An MRI is, is the kingpin. And an MRI is pretty well, fairly sensitive and specific. Let's look at our notes and see where, where we're sitting here. So here we go. Share screen. Get out of here and look at our notes. All right, let's move our hand. Let's move, go down. Sensitivity of a test. Specificity of a test. Gold standards. And look what it says at the last sentence. That's why in medicine we use a test battery, a series of imperfect tests, because we're not perfect. So for retrocochlear pathology, the best tests tend to be non-behavioral. Radiologic tests like MRI is better than CT scans. Those tend to be the best. In audiometry, the best one is an ABR, and the HIS doesn't do H ABRs. We're not trained to do them, so that's when you refer to an audiologist who does do them. Okay? Then acoustic reflexes, and then acoustic reflex decay. Acoustic reflex decay simply means to hold the loud sound. Eep! just like you, you do when, you know, when you're trying to create an acoustic reflex, and you see if the acoustic reflex weakens out. It's like doing a chin-up. How long can you hold your head up? When you, when you put the loud sound in the guy's ear, how long was the acoustic reflex able to hang in there and maintain tightness, or did it flag out? Did it decay? Acoustic reflex decay is a wrinkle on top of the acoustic reflex test. Again, not done by the HIS. All right, MRI with gadolium dye is the gold standard. It can easily detect tumors less than a centimeter. The hit rates, in other words, the true positives and correct rejection, 
in other words, true negatives, are about 99%. ABR has a hit rate of about 95%. Not bad. Correct rejection of about 89%. Not bad. All right. Word recognition, tone decay, acoustic reflex decay, they tend to fall below. They're not as good. Now, this ABAR and acoustic reflex decay are better than these. So write that in your notes. It should be in there, but it isn't. This is better than this. How come? Because this is non-behavioral, whereas this is behavioral. What's tone decay? Let's stop sharing and talk about tone decay. No one does it anymore. Why? Because it's not sensitive and it's not specific. What is it? This is what they used to do in the 1960s, the 1970s, even creeping into the 1980s, but we've long since given it up because it sucks. It's stupid, okay? They put a loud sound in the affected ear, the, the, the ear they suspect of having an eighth nerve tumor. So say the person has a mild to moderate loss due to the eighth nerve tumor, but you're not sure. So you want to test further. So you put like about 100 dB sound into the bad ear, and you have the guy hold his hand up as long as he hears that tone. Well, shoot, I'm going to put my hand down because I don't want to get noise-induced hearing loss. I don't want to listen to that loud sound. So you may get people who put their hand down because they don't want to listen to the loud sound. But the theory behind the tone decay test was this. You're overloading the eighth nerve. And because the eighth nerve has a tumor, it's going to fatigue. It's going to adapt to the tone. It's going to kind of eh, like the chin up thing. It can't hold on any longer. Uh, because of the eighth nerve tumor. And so the guy's going to put his hand down after about 30 seconds. Oh, tone decay. Now compare that to acoustic reflex decay. Acoustic reflex decay is at least non-behavioral. Loud sound put into the ear, and you're determining by tympanometry, do you have an acoustic reflex present? And does your acoustic reflex flag out after five seconds? Acoustic reflex decay takes 10 seconds. If your acoustic reflex flags out after five seconds, you've got acoustic reflex decay. Tone decay was a minute. <laughs> and if you held your, if you put your hand down after about 30 seconds, you were said to have tone decay. And that was a positive sign. In other words, bad, that you had an eighth nerve tumor. You can see that that test is not very specific, not very sensitive. It has been abandoned. Okay, we're just about at the end of today's Zoom session. Let's share screen once again and look at our PowerPoint slides and see where we are. But this is where we've covered today. All right. MRIs tend to be harder to get to, higher costs. ABR is cheaper and more available. But basically, behavioral audiometric tests for retrocochlear pathology unilateral sensory neural loss. You're looking for asymmetrical sensory neural loss in the absence of noise-induced hearing loss or Meniere's disease. Abnormally poor speech discrimination in the affected ear. The sensory neural loss may not even be that bad, but the speech discrimination may be alarmingly bad for the mild hearing loss that you're seeing. Rollover means that you're PI functions, your performance index functions, got rolled over or got worse with louder intensities. In plain English, let's look at what that might mean in terms of what we've covered so far. Let's see if I can find it. I'm looking. I'm a looking. See if we've got that. See if we have any, make any sense of that. Oh, I don't have that slide in here. Nonetheless, don't worry about it. All you need to think about there is your speech discrimination when you presented the words louder, got worse. Presented the words louder, got worse instead of better. 
Okay, and again, the thought was, oh, the eighth nerve has a tumor. And you know, when I'm talking louder into it, we're overloading the eighth nerve. And it's actually the performance gets poorer. Remember what PI functions were? Remember we, we talked about them last week? I'll draw you this, and I'll just show it to you on the screen so you have this and percent correct. I'm just going to quickly show you this, and then we'll... And this would be, I'll show it to you. Stop sharing screen and show it to you here. Look at the words on the bottom, intensity along the horizontal and percent correct along the vertical. And see how the rollover is like a hump? You did okay, you did terribly when the words were really soft. Where can I show this to you here? And as, the word, as you got louder, the word, your percentage did better. And then when you kept getting louder, your percentage did even poorer. You dropped. And that was called rollover. Old-fashioned test. People don't really do it anymore. It's tied together with your speech discrimination. And always remember that that's a behavioral test. Tone decay behavioral test. Rollover is the same kind of thing as tone decay, only you're using speech instead of a tone. And tone decay, you're holding up your hand as long as you hear the tone, and the theory is your eighth nerve gets overloaded and you can't hear it anymore because your eighth nerve got tired. Okay, same thing with rollover. Your speech discrimination reached a certain peak, but when you presented the words louder, it actually got worse. That's before we had CAT scans. That's before we had MRIs. We didn't always have CAT scans and MRIs, or even ABR. ABR came out in the 80s, okay, the 1980s. There was no such thing as the ABR in the 1960s and 70s. Old audiology relied on behavioral testing. Tympanometry came out in the 1970s and along with it, acoustic reflexes. And that was non-behavioral, okay? And acoustic reflex testing was used to look at eighth nerve tumors, but it's only mildly sensitive and mildly specific. So people still did tone decay and looked at rollover in speech discrimination testing. The performance index function or performance intensity function, PI function, would roll over. Weak tests, not sensitive, not specific. ABR came out, pretty sensitive, pretty specific. It became the king of looking at eighth nerve tumors. CAT scans came out. Yep, they too were pretty good at it. MRIs were developed especially in the 1990s, and that really improved the sensitivity and specificity of looking at eighth nerve tumors. So we've covered lots of ground today. We've covered some anatomy. We've covered some audiometry with it. We've covered some specific terms with it, all right, regarding eighth nerve tumors. So I'll just put my little marker here, we'll roll down, Next week, we'll kind of continue where, where we left off today. We'll kind of rev have a slow, short review of what we covered, and then we'll start talking more about eighth nerve tumors. We'll tell you more of a story about it, and then we will finish next week looking at tests of central auditory nervous function, system function, not eighth nerve tumors, but instead a test of listening. The kid can hear, he just can't listen. Attention deficit disorders, attention de hyperactivity disorders, okay? Learning disabilities, areas of the brain, of the hearing centers of the brain that supposedly are affected. Rather rare, but then again, sometimes overdiagnosed, okay? But we'll talk more about that next week. When you're looking at this section, though, do read about this in your notes because this is, covers lots of the stuff we talked about in ABR. Peaks one, three, five, all that stuff. Measure response with electrodes on the head. We covered some of that in pictures. This is just a verbal stuff in your notes to look at to go with the PowerPoint slides that you covered.
Okay, so next week we'll really look at how this this thing on central auditory testing is pretty short in your notes. It's only half a page long. And the top of this last page, we've kind of covered this already today. Okay, so we've covered lots of ground, lots and lots. All right, ABR testing, we said was done for two reasons, to determine hearing levels. If you can't get a behavioral test off of someone, like a baby or a liar, okay, or to see if there's eighth nerve pathology or pathology of the low brain stem. Acoustic reflex and acoustic reflex decay. We'll look at that a little bit next week just for fun. All right. Otoacoustic emissions are lousy at detecting retrocochlear pathology. They are a test of outer hair cell function, not inner. And the eighth nerve is associated with inner hair cells, not outer hair cells. So put a star by that one as well. We've covered lots of ground today. We'll finish this section next week. So I will stop sharing now and I'll stop recording now. Remember what I always say at the end of every Zoom session. Please watch it a second time. When you watch a movie a second time, you get a lot more out of it than when you watch it just once. Very important. If a class is worth two to three credits, that means two to three hours of class time. We spent about an hour and five minutes here. So do yourselves the favor of what do you call it, getting your money's worth out of your tuition and make sure you can glean whatever you can from these Zoom sessions. I'll stop recording now.